So I wanted to start today off by talking about something we all probably have experienced, and that is work deadlines. So you've got deadlines at work. Sometimes they're too short. Sometimes they're so long that you don't know what to do with yourself. I haven't been in too many of those, but I'd love to have some of them. Usually they're short deadlines, there's budget limits, not enough money, not enough resources, and a lot of business pressures, which often can lead to scope changes and scope creep in our applications. So how does this relevant to building applications with Vue? Well, the good news is that when you're learning new technology, it's usually a technology that you wanna choose will be something that you can pick to learn quickly. And you can successfully build powerful applications with Vue. So what I hope to show you today is by the end of this hour, you'll understand the basics of what you can do with Vue and how quickly you can get started and build powerful applications. My name is John Papa, and this is 20,000 foot view of Vue with the fundamentals of the Vue.js framework. I like to kick things off by first giving you a list of the resources that we'll be seeing throughout the presentation. I'll show this again at the end, and of course, I'll share this with Pluralsight to include in all of their follow-up materials. So don't worry if you don't get this now, but you're gonna get a chance to see all the different things we talked about today, including the demos, uh, the View Getting Started course, which was just released on Pluralsight a couple weeks ago, and then also how you can sign up to deploy your apps to Azure, which I'm gonna show you as well. As mentioned in the bio, I also host a podcast called Real Talk JavaScript, where we talk about Vue, React, Angular, and pretty much everything JavaScript in the workplace. So if you're interested in that, definitely check it out at realtalkjs.com. But first, why Vue? I mean, anytime someone tells you you should look at a technology, I think the first thing you should do is figure out, is this a technology I should even be interested in? And, and with Vue, I think that is absolutely true, but how do you know that? You gotta make the decision for yourself. And there's three things that I really look at with Vue. First, it is simple to get started. And even once you get going on larger apps, it's still simple to use. I like that. It's very powerful. It's not just something you can build a very simple, uh, quick demo with. You can build very powerful, successful applications. And you wanna make sure that the community is gonna support it. Is there a lot of support to update it, get new versions out? To fix bugs, is there a rich ecosystem? Can you find other people using it in scenarios? And the answer to that is yes. It is definitely a popular framework. It is one that has been well tested and has been around for a while now. So one of the keys is it's very easy to get going. You can get running in minutes and learn a ton in a week. I mean, seriously, there's so much you can do in just a week with Vue. Uh, when I first took a look at Vue a couple of years ago, I spent less than a day on it and I built a couple of little apps with it. And I was like, wow, I really understand the basics now. It's something that's very easy to get going and it just felt intuitive to my programming style. And I hope you'll find that too. So we're gonna start off by creating something called an index.htm page. And we're gonna do this by dropping a script tag in a page and setting a data value. And then we're gonna show that page and show quickly we can create a view app. And I'm gonna come back to this slide in just a moment. So what we're gonna do is build an app that looks like this. We're gonna do it from scratch. So first, we're gonna go open up an index HTML page. I'm gonna zoom in, make this full screen. I'm inside of Visual Studio Code, which is my favorite editor. And in this application, we're gonna just create some basic HTML first. So what does that mean? Well, I'm gonna use Emmet and just type in HTML, give my little tag there, and then I can type in head, and inside that head, I wanna create a script tag. I spell script right. And there's a source right there. And this one you gotta be very careful on. We're gonna pull in view from a CDN. So one way to use view is just to pull it in. No webpack, no other CLIs, nothing. You can do this simply by dropping a script tag on the page. As long as you type the link properly, which is always a question mark with me, then you're good to go. So CDN, jsdeliver.net, npm view, that'll pull it in. Now our app itself is gonna have a body and inside that body, we're gonna have a div. And inside that div, we're gonna name that with the ID of app. So we'll do this with Emmet like this. Notice I haven't yet hit tab and over on the right, we can see it's gonna create what's shown over your body with a div. Oops, and I got a typo, right? ID is not ID, the ID is going to be app. And we can see that over on the right hand side what it creates. 
And once I hit tab, it generates that. Now what I want to do is basically create a hello world inside this application. So I'm going to create an input tag just like this. And it's going to have text in it. And just to show that we've got this page working, let's go ahead and open this up. I'm going to use Finder to open it. If you're on Windows, you can use Explorer. Then I'm going to double click on this. And there is our amazing page with a big text box, which does nothing yet. So we know our page works. We just open it up really quickly. What do we do next? Well, we want to fill in that name. So inside the body down here, we want to create something called name. To do that, let's create a script tag down here. Now, normally we'd attach in another file, but just to make this easy, we're going to create a view object. Inside the view object, we're going to create an element, and it's going to be called app. Now, notice line 11 and line 6 match. The element name is basically saying, go create and attach this view object to this div with an ID of app. That's like our root of our application. Next, I want to create a data element here. So this is my data model. My data model is going to have a name. And that name to start off is going to be something like, uh, we'll call it Oliver. And then that name is just a data value. This could come out of a database or some serverless function, anything you want to get it from. Or you can just hard code it like we did here. Now to make it show up, what I'm going to do is up top, right below the input, I'm going to create a P tag for paragraph. And I'm going to use interpolation to say, show the name. And just to make sure it's working, I'm going to say hello, and I'll put an exclamation at the end of it. Now, if we go back to our browser and we refresh, we can see hello, Oliver. But how do we change the name? Now, inside of the app, I can create a V model. That's V for view, and then model's a data model. And we're saying bind this input directly to the name. So line 7 is binding the name on line 15. And then when we run this application, notice Oliver shows up up top here, or we can change it to Flynn, or we can change it to Colleen, or Ella, or Maddie, or anybody else that you want to put in here. So that's how quickly we can create a view application. Notice it's a single file. We've got a script tag. We've got a little bit of HTML from line six through nine. The only viewness that we have inside there in the template is the V model, which binds the name. We've got the name right here, which is going to be displayed. So this is read only. That's what the double curly braces means. And then down below, the magic that makes it work is two parts. First, we create a view object. What is view? Well, it comes out of that script tag. And we tell it, go look for the app inside of the app div. And then our data model has something called name in it. We could also have address if we want to. And then we could also have something like state. You could have sub objects if you want to as well really whatever you want to put in there. So that's our first view out that we can create from scratch in just moments. So getting back to the slides, what we just saw was how we can drop script tag on the page, set a data value, and then we're off to the races. Now, do you want to drop a script tag all the time? Well, not all the time, but there's definitely times to do that. So if you've got an existing application with ASP.NET or PHP or Ruby or Java or you name it, and you don't want to re-architect everything, but you just want to drop a brand new piece of functionality in your app, and you want to do that without a lot of build processes, you can create a very small island of functionality in your application by creating a view page like this and including it in one of those other technologies. So that's powerful. But let's say you want to do an entire app with view. Now, you want to do an entire app from view, there's a lot of things you want to set up. And what makes it difficult? Well, when you're starting from a blank slate, you've got to get everything organized, that project structure. You know, there's a style guide for view that you can follow up on their website. You've got to understand all the ways to organize your code. What's your build system? How do you generate the files? How do you create tests? How do you make sure everything's pointing at the right place? How do you customize and organize everything? And then what about plugins or other parts of the ecosystem? This is where starting from scratch in a blank slate gets kind of crazy. And instead, I recommend using something like the Vue CLI. And we're going to walk through how this can work. And then at the end, we'll go ahead and create an app. So the Vue CLI includes all of these things out of the box. You don't have to use them all, but you do get this option. So you can set up Stylus or CSS or SAS. You can set up different testing frameworks, like Jest or Mocha or Cypress. 
You can set up using TypeScript or just JavaScript. So many different things that you can do right out of the box. And you just basically set a flag and it does it for you. The key here is that it makes it easy to create an app that just works, which to me, I don't know about you, in today's modern JavaScript world, I like not having to deal with all the setup of the application. I want a CLI to do that for me. So how do you get started? First, you can only go install Node from the Node.js org. And I recommend that you download the LTS version. If you're not familiar with the versioning, LTS stands for long-term support. Now that's really important because you wanna make sure you get the most recent long-term support version. And they'll tell you right on that Node.js page what it is at the time. And then finally, you'll run and install the Vue CLI. So we'll use NPM, that's our package manager here, and we'll say install dash G means global, this Vue CLI, and that's going to install it onto our computer so we can use it to generate apps. Now, once we have the Vue CLI, we can create an app. We just say Vue, and then the command is create, and then we name the application. We could call it Hello World. And then you see the into the Hello World folder, and then you simply run an NPM script called NPM run serve, which will then build the application, and then it will serve it into your browser. Easy peasy. Here's some basic commands that you can run from the CLI. We talked about create to create an app. Help is amazing. Don't ever minimize how much help you can get from these tools right out of the box. So dash dash help will give that to you. Uh, and linting is great because it'll lint the code for you and also fix if you'd want it to. It'll build the code. Now, if you've used Angular for their CLI, one big difference between the Vue and the Angular CLI is that when you build with Vue, it builds a production ready app means it's got all the minification in there and everything's been cache busted. Everything's built for production. In Angular, you have to give it the flag of production. So it's one of the differences between two of the major frameworks. I like it this way actually, because I only build when I'm gonna go to production or to another server. So you might be wondering, well, when you wanna run and test your local code, don't you build? I say, yes, but I do it through the NPM run serve flag. And that's gonna build it in memory, which is super fast and it's gonna build it so I can debug it locally. Now I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that the Vue CLI has a UI. Yeah, you heard that right. There's a CLI, which is all terminal based and it has a user interface. That user interface is really nice because if you're brand new to this, you can actually go through this UI and it gives you a visual way to do things like create your apps or configure different pieces of it, add in plugins, Maybe you want to pull in Vuex or routing or other features, or maybe a bootstrap like library. You can also build and serve the code and it gives you a lot of visual feedback, which is super nice. Now I don't generally recommend starting here. I like this once you know what Vue is doing, but I point it out because it is very, very well built. And then it kind of looks like this. You can actually explore some of the code inside there and you can see the build assets and stats. At the bottom, it even shows you the speed stats for how slow or fast your app would run. All right, so we started off by showing how to build and create a Vue app, and we actually wrote our first one. But let's take a step back and look at the different main pieces of syntax. These are the things that you need when you're building an application. So first, displaying text. Whenever you see these curly braces, that means render the data model that's between them. So here we say, hello, name. Name must be a data model inside of our view component. And that in our case could have been Colleen or Ella. So that's also known as interpolation. It's basically a shortcut syntax to render out the text. And this has been around in many web technologies for a long time. You can also use V dash text. You'll see the V dash in a lot of these different template syntax commands. I don't use this personally that all that often, but it is available. And you can say v dash text equals your model, and that'll do the same thing. So down below, you can see we've got our model called data, and that returns a function with an object in it. And this is our data model for the component. Okay, but we can bind to other things too. Imagine we have some kind of a header bar inside of our application. And that header bar, we wanna to bind to an HTML property. So imagine we've got this anchor up top, and that anchor has a v bind. That's a new different syntax we just saw. Remember, V means view and bind means you're gonna to bind to the HTML property 
to the right of this command. So vbind colon says bind to the href. What am I binding? I'm assuming that the word GitHub is not a string. It's actually the data model that's going to contain perhaps the link to GitHub rep repository. So the GitHub right there, that is a model. Well, there's a shortcut syntax. Instead of typing v dash bind colon, you can just type colon, which is pretty much what I do all the time. Now that just binds to a property. What about two-way binding? We also saw this earlier where we bound to a name, but let's say we've got an object that's a hero and the hero has a first name. Now let's say that that hero, uh, let's say her name is Madeline. It needs to show up on the page. As the user types the word Madeline, the value of hero.firstName would change. So to make that work, we can have a label here, which is displays first name, and then an input, and the only viewishness that we have is that V model at the bottom. That V model is view dash model, and then it shows hero.firstName. So assuming we have a data model called hero, that's an object that has a first name property, when we type in Madeline into the input box, it'll automatically update that model. And that gives us two-way binding between the template and the component. Now, Vue has several shortcut syntaxes for template syntax. We've seen one already for the colon, when we saw V dash bind colon. We're going to see a few others too, and we're going to come back to this. I'm showing you the full syntax, so if you see that in documentation, you'll understand why you don't see that in other places as well. But moving along, one common thing we do is render a list. We'll have a list of products or items or anything out there in the world. So we use v-4, and v-4 just repeats over a list. In this case, it's called item list, and then the item becomes the iterator for that list. Now you can also bind to a unique key for faster rendering. That way, it's kind of giving view a hint that the rows that I have, this is the unique identifier in the row. So when the list changes, don't re-render everything. Just re-render the ones where there's new or different keys. Or if the key is the same, replace that row. So here we've got our V4. We're going through a list of heroes. So we have a heroes array, let's say. And that heroes array has a bunch of heroes in it. And then the first hero could be Madeline. It could have a first name of name and a property of name. And then we just render out hero.name to show Madeline. Now notice we also have the key, which is the hero ID. That's to show the unique identifier for the row. If you want to get an index, you can also do this syntax. Notice here in the V4, we can say not just like person and people, we can say person comma index in people with the parentheses around it. That allows us to access an index property so we can get a number next to the name as we render it. Now, along with the for, we also have an if. So we have v4 and v if. v if allows us to conditionally render or not render content on the page. So here, we've got selected hero. That could be an object. If that object has some kind of an object in it, like an object that's got Madeline as our hero, then that would then render that div and allow us to ex uh, evaluate the expression that says selected hero dot first name, which could show Madeline. Let's say there is no selected hero. If there's no selected hero and it's set to null or undefined or anything like that, a falsy value, this div would not even render and therefore the selected hero.first name would never get evaluated. So that's a very great way for when you have a list with master details to show the details on, down below it. Let's move along to event bindings. We've been talking so far about how to render data and then also how to accept input and bind that on the screen. But how about accepting user input? So event bindings will execute when an event occurs. And we have an expression called v on. So we say v on colon and the name of the event. That could be any HTML event such as click. So over here on the right, you can see that we've got a click event on the button. And then when they press that button, the OK method's going to call, and then it'll fire and do some activity. So there's a couple moving parts here. Let's, let's explore this for a moment. Notice I said it was V dash on on the left. Well, you don't see a V dash on on the right. There's a note here that says the at sign, that A with the circle around it, that is a shortcut syntax for V dash on. So instead of saying V dash on colon click, we can just say at click. 
which kind of reads better too. It's like, all right, so at the click, we're going to call the method called OK. Well, where's the method? The method is down in our component down below. We can see there's a matching method name called OK. And that function could do whatever we wanted to do. It could submit a form, it could do a validation check, it could do anything. So now we can see if we can bind to any HTML event by doing at and then the event name. Now what about class bindings? Sometimes we have to change things based upon the class. So a class binding syntax could allow us to highlight a row. If the row is selected, make the background yellow. And maybe there's a CSS class that does that. To do that, we can just say colon class. Remember, colon is a shortcut for v-bind. So we're really saying v-bind the class property in this HTML element to, and then this object literal, which is the class name on the left and the expression on the right. So how did this work? Here we've got a selection, and in that selection, we're binding it to the hero's power. So our heroes have superpowers. And we're saying, if the uh, take the class, which is colon class over here on the right, and we're saying bind that to the invalid class. So I have a CSS class somewhere called invalid. It's going to add the invalid class if the expression on the right is true. If there is no uh, hero power in this case, so if there's no hero power, it's going to show invalid. If there is a hero power, it'll remove it from that select. And you can watch this inside the DOM by exploring the DOM when you change these values. Okay, so we just learned the basics of template syntax. The good news is that that's really about, I'd say, 75% of Vue. If you can get this part of Vue to get down, you can build some really robust apps right out of the box. So let's recap some of the template syntax. Here we've got V on click, or we've got at click, which is the shortcut. This is how we handle events. V dash bind is you can bind to an attribute. You can also just do colon. We can do V dash model to do two way binding, V dash if for conditional elements, and V dash for to loop over items. All right, but what happens when we have a component and it needs to start up? This is when lifecycle hooks become important. How do you know when the component is about to start or when it goes away or when a binding changes? Here are the different hooks that you can use. So in this case, we've got our different lifecycle hooks and you can learn about these more at this documentation. But the one I really wanna pay attention to here is created. When our component is created, this is when we're gonna to wanna to do a lot of things. So when we create, going back a little, when we create a component, maybe this is when we go out and we get the data to fill in the component. Maybe this is when we prompt the user for something. Maybe we run other initialization logic. There's a very simple lifecycle hook that we can hook into in this case. Now there's some special things that they're not necessarily used in every component, but I think these are very powerful. Computed properties and watchers. Let's explore each of these quickly. Computed properties, now these are going to fire whenever a dependency changes in your component. So let's take a look what that means. There, it's gonna take a value like first name and last name. And whenever one of those two changes, if we make a computed with those two, then it'll automatically update the value of the computed. And it will cache those values based upon the dependencies. So it doesn't reevaluate until it has to. So let's say we created a computed here. Like you don't have a full name property maybe in your database, so it comes across as first name and last name for our hero, but you want to display full name. So what you could do is create a computed, we named it full name, and then we take the two parts that we want to put together. In this case, I'm using the template syntax to say, display the first name and the last name of the hero. And then when either the first name or last name changes, it could become Ella Papa, for example, the full name property will then notify the UI wherever it's bound and redisplay Ella Papa as the name. So you can see computer properties can be amazingly helpful when you're creating applications. So you don't have to worry about updating the individual properties. Now watchers are a little bit similar because watchers will also watch your values in your data model, but there's different use cases you can use them for. For first, we create a watch element in our component we're saying, watch what? Well, I want to watch the hero data model. So I'm assuming there's a data model in my component called hero. And whenever it changes, Vue's going to watch it. 
and the new value and the old value will come into this function, and then I can take some action on that. Why would you want to do this when data changes? Why would you want to react to those? Maybe you're evaluating the data. Maybe you want to make an asynchronous call back down to your database and do some validation. Maybe you want to check to see is the new value acceptable to you in your application. So there's a lot of different things you can do with a watch in your app. So whenever that model changes, it's going to automatically watch it, in this case the hero, and then take some action. Now, if you're confused on watchers and computed, when both of them work for your situation, computed's often the better choice. Computed's are extremely powerful and used everywhere, and quite frankly, the syntax is simpler. So one of the last pieces I want to show before we build a little bit of an app here and kind of demonstrate these is component organization. So far, everything we've done could be done inside a single component. I don't know about you, but most of the apps that I build have a lot of components in them. For example, you could have Heroes, which has a list component, and then it has a search component, and then a Hero Details component. And maybe your Heroes list component has a list item component and a custom button component. And you can see where I'm going with this. There's a large component tree structure that you can build. So let's take a look at how we can deal with this. What happens when you want to pass values from one component to another? Imagine we have a heroes view component and it has a hero detail component. The heroes view has a list of heroes. You select a hero. Now you need to go and tell the hero detail, here's that hero. So in that hero's view, it's got an element here called hero detail. Hero detail is the name of our child component. So the hero detail component is inside the hero's component. There's our parent-child relationship. Now we have to pass the selected hero down to the hero detail. Notice we're also only doing this if there is a selected hero. We're using that VF right there. So imagine the hero detail view looks like this and we name our components with the dot view extension. This hero detail view just says, hey, I've got props. What are props? Props are the way we pass property values into, in this case, a child component. So we're passing the value from the hero detail for the hero into the hero property inside the child. So when on the left, the hero's view has a selected hero, the VF will be true, and then the hero detail element will be rendered. The hero's view parent component will then pass the selected hero into the hero detail component on the right through that hero property. And then the hero prop over here will then get the value of that selected hero. And that's how easy it is to pass values from a parent to a child. So in this case, we're going to pass values from a parent to a child using bindings on the left with that colon. We've already learned that syntax and then props on the right, which is what we just learned here. This is like passing an input property into your child component. So here is an example. We can pass values in through props by saying, all right, on the top, we've got a prop here called person. And then we can pass the value from the prop down below into the child component. So at the bottom right, the person detail is inside of your parent component. The person detail is the child. It's defined in there saying, hey, inside my person's list, let's say, I want to show the person detail when somebody has been selected. And then what I'm doing is saying that colon person, just like our colon hero, is passing the selected hero up to the child component in the upper left. And then we've also got something called an output. Notice the at unselect and at person changed. So inside of our child component, again, in the upper right, sorry, the upper left, the child component is the upper left, and that is emitting a refresh. Let's say the person changed that inside the detail. Somebody changed the first name from Ella to Colleen. What we can do is use view with this emit function. So it's dollar sign emit. We can then fire an event. The first parameter is the name of the event, person changed. And the second parameter is any data you want to pass along with it. So how does the parent receive that event? It simply uses the at person changed to accept that event and then fires its own local function called save, which will then accept in any parameters you pass to it. So we just learned how to pass values in 
and then back out. Now let's go build an app real quick to see how some of this stuff works. First, let's take a look at a completed application, which if you follow along in the course that I have on Pluralsight, you get to build a lot of this. There's a URL here at papa-heroes-view, azurewebsites.net, that you can go to. Just to prove that, type it in, and the first page is heroes. And inside the heroes here, we've got heroes and villains. So I've got some extra features in this, but notice here, I've got a component that is showing a list of heroes. These are all Vikings from the History Channel. So all these heroes are showing up in my list. Now, when I select one of these, I'm actually gonna show the hero detail. So I'm gonna select, let's say, Lagertha. I'll hit edit. And when I do that, what you can imagine is happening is a V if is then saying, when there's a selected hero, show this component and don't show the other one. And then when I unselect that selected hero, it's gonna go back. So when I hit cancel, it's deselecting the selected hero. And there's my list. And back into the details, we can see here, we've got some V models showing up. This is a read only field right there. I can't change it. So that's probably using just the interpolation with the double curly braces. So we've got an example of all this in there, but let's go build our own app doing this. And oh, before I forget, you're gonna get all this code too. Uh, if you go to the links at the end, which I'll show you, it brings you to this repository, which also lets you run this app, which is live on the internet. So going back into the app, we just saw that we had this simple app earlier, but let's go into here and let's create. We'll do view, create, we'll call this demo, and we'll let it run. Now this will just take a moment. We're gonna select default because we don't wanna worry about selecting options. And this will just take the default options for view and take a moment to download them off the internet and build an app for us. So what it's doing right now is the view CLI is generating the project and I'm gonna close the index HTML and it's gonna put it in this demo folder. And we'll kind of take a look as it's creating the files. First thing it did is create these dev dependencies, which it's using to generate the app. And then once it does that, it creates the rest of the package file. You'll see up here, there's some scripts for serving, building, and linting. We'll see our dependencies with the current version of view it's using. And then what's really cool is if you ever look at the output of the terminal, I'll zoom in a little bit, you can see that it says CD into demo. So I'll do that and then run and serve it. So then what I'm gonna do here is say NPM run serve. And it should start up the application. It's gonna build it in memory. I can then click on this link and there is our first view app. So coming back into the app, we're gonna keep it running and we're gonna explore a little bit here. Inside the app view, notice it's passing a value into the message right there. We're gonna get rid of that. It's gonna use this hello world child component, which is defined down here. So we define a child component. So our parent component is app view. And we're gonna say, go ahead and add a child component called hello world right there. Now, if we go back to the running app, we can see it's right here. And actually, let me keep the app over on the left and we'll keep the code on the, well, the app on the right and the code on the left. If I go into the component called hello world, now we can see there's a whole bunch of stuff in there. Let's get rid of everything inside that HTML just to make things easier. As soon as I delete it and press save, all you can see over on the right is just V. Now notice there is no message anymore. We had a prop, but let's go ahead instead and we'll use a snippet. These are also included in the uh, resources links. Snippet creates a data model and I'm gonna call this first model message. And inside that, we'll just put the word value and it shows up right there. Uh, we can change this to something like uh, hello uh, view folks and it will automatically update on the right hand side now let's say that we have a name over here and the name will start off as three question marks we want to display that we could then create an input element up top that input element let's create a v dash model and we'll bind it to name what i really want to do is change this message uh, and we'll just create a P tag, create a new one. We want to create a message here that says, uh, let's name my new puppy. And we'll put the name of that puppy right in here. So we can play a game together and everybody can start voting for, what do you want my new puppy to be named? And we can type in names. We could say, hey, this is one of the ones that my son wanted. 
Uh, my daughter wanted this name. Uh, you can say anything in here that you want. And actually, my new puppy is going to be named Oliver. That's what my family chose. So you can type that in here. It's bound to the name data element, and it shows up on the screen up top. So once we do that, let's say we want to put a list together. Maybe we had a list of names. So we could say puppy names like this. In that list, we could create a bunch of puppy names. And now we could create an object in here that's got an ID and give an ID of 10. And then we'll do name of, we'll do Oliver is the first one. And just to make life easier, I'll copy and paste a couple of them. Oops. And we'll do uh, 40. And then after Oliver, we had Flynn and he is a boy. Uh, then we also had Eric and we had Coda and some other options. Let's say we want to display those on the screen or we want to pick one of those. Well, then we can loop, loop through them if we'd like to. Create a UL with an LI like this. And inside of there, we can create a V4. So notice, oops, let's just create the V4. We can just come into here and we can say, uh, we'll go to PN for puppy name in puppy names like that. And then we'll instantly get a PN dot name. So we can then loop through and show the list of names anywhere we want it to. Now, oops, you got to put in a dash in the V4 up here to make it work and get it in place. Uh, you're also going to see that you're going to get error messages from the tooling to tell you that we didn't put a key for a bind directive. That's really important because since we have a key, we want to use that. So we could then add in that key later. So I'm going to leave that there now just so you can show how it works. Uh, you can also show the documentation for it, or you can skip it for a line. Lots of cool stuff that you can do. So now you can see how you can add any of these names in here that you want, and then show how you can use it with a list. So we easily can see how we can instantly add different pieces to our application. And we've got a parent and our app view component and a hello world and our child. Now kind of moving along a little bit to some of the more advanced features that you can do, let's take a look at the bigger app. So you might be thinking, what else can I do besides throw data on the screen? Now I've opened up the Chrome developer tools here, here and then over on the right hand side, we can click on the V, which gives us access to view dev tools. Now, if I had a production build, notice the view dev tools is going to tell me you can't look at these. So in production, you can't explore and debug your app, which is good because you want people doing that. But in dev mode, you can definitely do that. So I go back to our demo and I click on the V. It'll let you open up inside of the panel here, this view item. And then I can zoom in a little. And these tools are super powerful at debugging your application. Notice I can select hello world. We can see the puppy names array. We can see the different values. We can even edit it. Let's say you didn't like Flynn and you wanted to call it Flynn Rider. You could do that, press save. And as soon as you do that, notice Flynn Rider over on the left. So it's pretty cool how you can explore the different elements. You can also explore uh, state management solutions in view with Vuex. You can switch over to events and select an event that's being fired. Uh, you can also look at your data analytics and you can look at your settings for this. You can go to like dark mode, light mode, and a bunch of other features. But it's really nice how you can explore the different component structure in your app and do some debugging right with this tool. Last bit I want to talk about is what else can you do? So going back to this main demo, notice we have routing in our application. So of course you can create routing which changes the URL, which you can kind of see up here. It's currently slash villains, or you can do slash heroes right there. So we can set up routing in our app. We can set up state management in our application so that we have data values that are being controlled in a single place. You can set up HTTP calls with a library called Axios. You can hook in your own library like uh, Bulma or Bootstrap or Tailwind or Material, any of these different like display libraries that you want to use. And you can put it all together using the view CLI to build it and then deploy it. Okay, so getting back to the slides, we just saw how to create our first app. We saw all the main pieces of the template syntax. And then we built an application using the view CLI and then served it. I promised that you'd be able to get to all these different things. But before I do show you those links again, here's a bunch of links I think you'll find really valuable. If you want to go get HTTP data over across the internet, 
While you can use the Fetch API, most people who do view end up using Axios. Axios is a wonderful library for making HTTP calls, and it's extremely popular and well-maintained. I highly recommend that. If you want to add routing to your app, there's an official view router library that you can pull down. If you want to use the VCLI, which I, I recommend highly, you can use the VCLI from here. I actually have a course on Pluralsight called VCLI and getting started with it. So you can check that out on Pluralsight if you want to learn more about the powerful features of Vue CLI. If you want to learn about Vue X, you can pull that down from this library. That is going to be how you do state management. So once you have a bunch of data in your application, Vue X is amazing. So definitely check that out. Uh, you can use Vuetify for UX. There's dozens of things you can do uh, with that as far as setting up different controls and components. And then finally, everybody writes bugs, myself included. You saw a couple today. And having a good debugging tool uh, is excellent for this. So if you want to debug with VS Code and Vue, there's a really good cookbook on the Vue.js documentation, and you can get it from this link. And finally, you can do everything I did today if you follow along through these different links. There's the Vue docs, views, uh, there's the VS Code, the dev tools and extensions, and then probably the best links here are the Vue Heroes demo, which we got to see. So you can go check that out at this link. or you can check out my full course on Pluralsight on Vue from this link right here. And that's the Vue Getting Started course, which just came out a couple of weeks ago. And if you want to learn how to deploy your app to Azure, like we showed the Vue Heroes demo, you can actually get a free trial by clicking on this link down below at psv-free. So with that, you can build really successful applications that are super powerful with Vue, knowing just what we learned today. And obviously, there's so much more you can do as well. I'd love to answer your questions at this point. So I'll hand it back over to the Pluralsight folks to queue those up. Hey, John, thanks so much. Um, I We've had quite a few questions come in already, as you can imagine. Um, there is a question section in your control panel. And if you're able to locate that, you can um, expand that out and start to see the ones that have come through. I can. I'm trying to make it bigger. OK. Extremely small, so give me one sec. Let's see if I can somehow make this bigger. Yes, I did. Great. Okay, beautiful. All right, I guess I'll just start reading these off and answering as, as we go. Awesome. Sounds good. Okay, so why would we ever use Vue.js over something like React or Angular? Uh, the short answer is personal choice. Vue, React, and Angular are all very powerful. They all do very similar things in just different ways. Honestly, it's like why some people like pizza with pepperoni and some like it with anchovies and some people just like it with plain cheese. You just got to pick your style of building these things. Uh, I happen to like Vue uh, when you go into a shop when nobody has experience with any of these three. I find Vue is very easy to teach people out of the box. So something to give a shot to. Uh, what I recommend a lot of folks for is try a one-day app like do some experimentation with each one of these and see what you think. And I've actually done a presentation on this topic up on the web. So if you search for choosing your JavaScript framework and John Papa, you'll find a video where I uh, talked about this at .js last year. Uh, as Vue has a way to handle complex forms like reactive forms and Angular. Vue does have a way to handle complex forms. Uh, generally, we don't use in Vue, we don't use RxJS uh, as uh, much as we do in Angular. Uh, so RxJS is super popular, and it's something that Angular uses heavily. But in Vue, you can use it. There's libraries to hook it in if you want to, but you don't have to. Uh, there are definitely some very good form libraries with Vue as well, though. Vue 3 is coming out. Will my Pluralsight course be updated? Uh, yes. Once Vue 3 is out, I will go through the process of updating the, uh, the Vue course that I have on Pluralsight. Uh, besides view official website for docs and tutorials, can you propose something else? Uh, yes, the course that I just put out uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, great plug right there. Uh, so the docs are really amazing, quite frankly. I think they're really awesome. Uh, you can also go follow some of the core team members. People like Chris Fritz or Evan Yu or Sarah Drasner are just amazing. And they all have uh, really good content on the web. And there's a huge view community. In fact, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention there's a community called Vue Vixens. Vue Vixens is a group, it's a nonprofit that I believe Jen Looper and many other great people run. And what they do is they set up workshops to teach uh, women Vue in a day, and they do these all across the world. 
So those are free workshops you can take too. Can we create a mobile app with Vue? Absolutely. So Vue has support for creating PWAs. Um, one of the early screens I showed, which had a lot of features on it, the VCLI, showed you can create a PWA with Vue too. And it's very popular. Uh, it seems to be a newer version of Knockout, which I am sure is putting naively. That's the question I have here. I'm trying to read the rest of the question. Uh, how is it better than Knockout? How does it work seamlessly with TypeScript or JavaScript as the way to go? So a couple of questions in there. Knockout JS, if you're not familiar, was a data binding library. Yes, Knockout just did data binding. Vue, Angular, and React all have their own way of effectively showing data on the screen as well, but they do so much more. So there's pieces of data binding uh, in all three of these frameworks, but there's so much more than what Knockout did. Uh, also, does it work seamlessly with TypeScript or JavaScript? Yes, in Vue 2, I highly recommend JavaScript. Vue 3 is gonna be rewritten from scratch in TypeScript, which will allow you to have, they're claiming backwards compatibility with Vue 2, so if you wanna use JavaScript there, but they're also gonna make it easier to use TypeScript in Vue 3, which is one of the cool things coming out. How do you rate Vue.js framework from other JavaScript frameworks? I think we kind of discussed that already in the first question. Uh, I think Vue, React, and Angular are all really awesome. Uh, I've had a good experience with all three of them. I've had the most experience with Angular, but I really appreciate a lot of what's in Vue and React. And quite frankly, if I was starting an app today, I'd pick one of those three. And it would have been quite a bit on what team I was working with and what their goals were and what they've already done and that kind of stuff. How does Vue handle component dependencies? I mean, how do we inject, uh, do like dependency injection? So if let's say you wanted to have services like Angular services and do dependency injection, uh, that's baked into Angular. There's a library, actually more than one, with Vue where you can actually connect dependency injection into Vue if you want to do that. Uh, although a lot of Vue apps don't bother with dependency injection, they just import a module and then use it. So it's really up to you how you want to do it. It is not forced on you in Vue, but you can opt in by adding another library. Can you please explain the difference between mounted and created? Good question. Uh, I go into this more on the course, but effectively created comes first. That's when the component is created and mounted is when it's mounted on the DOM. So there are some libraries, um, going back in my annals of using jQuery UI libraries, there's some different components that you could pull in from jQuery UI, which needed to know once the elements were mounted on the DOM. So mounted is great for hooking into things like that. Is Vue suitable for a scenario in which I need to scale up a solution bit by bit? Yes, absolutely. Um, I have not run into any situations with Vue, React, or Angular, for that matter, where they just don't cut the mustard. Please, where can we access recorded video? I will leave that up to the Pluralsight folks to answer that. I believe that if you go to this link, um, they, will, they will email you information later. If not, this link should lead you to the recording later. What IDE, what IDE are you using? Visual Studio Code, and there's a link to that in the resources, which we'll include as well. Uh, I love that for any JavaScript. There are many Emmet extensions available for VS Code. Which one is John using? None, actually. Emmet is built into VS Code, and it gives you basic Emmet, uh, full, full Emmet features out of the box. So you don't even need any extensions for that. The view stuff that I did, which for creating the view, uh, the V model and the V4 and stuff, that is from Sarah Drasner's Vue Snippets extension, which there's also a link for that in the resources. Uh, how do I compare React and Redux immutable style versus Vue and Vuex? Uh, very similar. So Redux is the state management model that came out of the React ecosystem. And then Vuex or V-U-E-X is the similar model for Vue. And you can definitely check that out. And I, I have a very, um, I think it's like 45 minute long module in the Getting Started course on how to use Vuex and how it, the whole thing even works. And quite frankly, it all starts off with, do you even need it? Because you don't need that kind of a thing for every app. Uh, John, what about Nuxt.js? Nuxt.js, excellent. Thanks for calling that out, Marlon. Uh, that is a library that lets you do things like server-side rendering with Vue. Uh, it's a great library and it works awesome. So you can definitely uh, check that out, but you don't need that to get started, for example. But that's another great part of the ecosystem is that is available. Do you think Vue takes less time to get up to speed on or build apps with than Angular? Ah, it's hard to tell. Like, I teach a lot of people and I can teach Angular or Vue or React for that matter in a day to get the fundamentals going. Which one do people grok onto faster? 
I think it depends. If assuming we had no knowledge of any of this stuff from other than JavaScript, I do think that Vue of the three libraries is easiest to get going. However, if you have TypeScript experience or any experience with a typed language, Angular really kind of follows a lot of those kind of um, policies and conventions. So Angular is very easy to get going if you've got Java or .NET backgrounds too. So any of those can work. Uh, if you simply love JavaScript, I've taught a couple classes where people didn't want to go down the road of this template syntax, React really speaks to them. So it really depends what kind of a person you are to figure out which one is easiest to get going with. Are there a lot of changes expected between Vue 2 and Vue 3? Uh, from what I'm understanding under the covers, yes. But from the usability side, it's supposed to be backwards compatible with the syntax from Vue 2. Uh, we'll see what ultimately comes out of that. Uh, Evan Yu is the one owning that, and you can uh, reach out to him. He's got some roadmaps. He's published already some of it publicly. And does it make sense to learn Vue 2 in depth if Vue 3 around the corner? Yes, absolutely, because the usability side, he's not going to, uh, the team, the Vue team is not going to just basically take all the learnings they've had over many years and upset the apple cart, if you will. So your apps will still work. Uh, the skills that you're learning with Vue 2, you'll still be able to apply those to Vue 3, although there'll be additional things you can do, especially the TypeScript parts. Um, and I believe they're also looking into hooks. Question, what are the recommended testing libraries for Vue? Well, out of the box, you can use Mocha or Jest, so you can pick either one of those. Uh, I happen to love end-to-end -end testing, and I use Cypress for that. Uh, let's see here. I'm using Vue.js with Blackboard CRM. The code is much easier to maintain when just using the CDN. Can you recommend any good resource or advanced Vue CDN development? Um, I don't know of any resources for, that's kind of specific, Vue.js with a CDN type development. Uh, really, any of these libraries on a CDN, there's plenty of material out there for how do you host it on a CDN. Um, you can use Akamai or Amazon's or, or Azure CDN for that matter. Let's see here, a couple left to go. If TypeScript is there for Vue 3, you can use WebStorm for scripting. Yeah, you can use WebStorm. You can use VS Code, you can use Visual Studio, you can use Vim, you could use Notepad or Sublime if you like. Uh, any of these editors will work. Let's see here, uh, I'm a bit confused with the emit on Vue. Oh, good, uh, good question here. Is the emit, the dollar sign emit, similar to AngularJS's version or how is it different? So dollar sign emit is a built-in uh, method that we can use inside of Vue. We saw it in this video where I said this dot dollar sign emit, and I had two parameters on it. The first is I'm emitting an event, and the first parameter is the name of the event, and the second parameter is optional, and it's any parameters to pass with it. So the emit is a way that you can send a message from a child component to a parent component. That's what the emit does for us. What unit testing framework do I suggest for Vue apps? Honestly, I really like Jest lately, but I've got about seven years of experience with Mocha. So most of the time I just choose Mocha and run with it because I know it so well. Uh, but Jest is really, really popular and I have no problem with that either. So if you were getting started and had no experience in either today, I probably would pick Jest. But uh, there's so many resources out there for Mocha uh, and it's just a tried and true framework that I honestly, you could pick it either way and it works just as well. I would just be consistent and choose the same one. I think we covered all the questions and we still have four minutes to go. So whew, hopefully I didn't talk too much for you all. And I hope you all enjoyed this uh, presentation. That was so awesome, John. Uh, thanks as always for diving into all of those questions. I know I, I speak for everyone uh, when I say thank you for you taking the time to, to tackle those. Um, just to reiterate, one question did sneak through about the recording, um, and everyone that is in attendance today, um, by nature of registering for this webinar, you will receive a follow-up email in the next uh, day or two with a recording of the webinar. So if you want to rewatch it or, or share it with a colleague, uh, that will be your opportunity to do so. Um, and John, before we hop off, I just want to give you one final chance to maybe leave uh, you know a final takeaway with the audience here. Yeah, I think the big takeaway is it's there's so many different JavaScript frameworks out there that it gets hard to figure out not only what to use but what not to pay attention to. And you'll notice I focused on React, Angular, and Vue when I'm talking about what to use. The more important thing you might be looking at is why am I not looking at the rest of these? And it's not because they're bad or they're good. This isn't about good and bad. This is about which ones can I find the most support for, 
that a lot of people are using. I can hire a team to work with them that have a really rich and robust ecosystem and won't lead me down a path that is great for a while and then hit a brick wall with. And Vue, Angular, and React all lead you there and give you success. But the big key for today is if you're choosing Vue, and I love Vue for teams, you can build really powerful apps really quickly without a lot of learning process. So hopefully you enjoy that.